Hub History, the show that brings you fascinating stories from Boston history. This is episode 36, Boston in the Golden Age of Piracy, part two. Hi, I'm Jake. And I'm Nikki. This week, we're going to continue our tale of Boston in the Golden Age of Piracy. This time, we'll pick up the story at the end of the War of the Spanish Succession. We'll learn about some of the most fearless and notorious pirates in history, as well as one of the most ineffective. We'll see how one of these pirates gave a founding father his start in public life, which U.S. president's great-grandfather bought a former pirate as a slave, and what other president's great-grandfather decapitated a pirate with an axe. But before we talk about pirates, it's time to take a look at what's coming up this week in Boston history. Monday is July 10th, and on July 10th, 1776, a group of delegates from the Micmac and St. John's tribes of northern Maine arrived in Watertown. They were wined and dined, entertainment was provided, and negotiations began. A few days later, they signed the Treaty of Watertown, pledging peace and cooperation between the nations. It was the first treaty ratified by the newly independent United States of America. Maybe we were feeling insecure, but we introduced the treaty by justifying our right to enter into it. Whereas the United States of America and General Congress assembled have in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly published and declared that these United Colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved, and that as free and independent states they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all the other acts and things which independent states may of right do. We, the governors of the state of Massachusetts Bay, do by virtue hereof, and by the powers vested in us, enter into and conclude the following treaty of friendship and alliance. On July 11, 1914, the Globe reported on the big league debut of a promising new pitcher. The Red Sox introduced Babe Ruth, one of the Baltimore recruits, to the crowd at Fenway Park, and with the assistance of Dutch Leonard, Ruth led the Red Sox to a 4-3 win over Cleveland. The small crowd at Fenway Park enjoyed the game, which only lasted a little over an hour. All eyes were on Ruth as he displayed why he is a veteran in many ways. He has natural delivery, great command, and a curveball that is tough for opposing hitters. However, there's still room for improvement for him, but he will undoubtedly progress with the help of manager Bill Kerrigan. Ruth held the Naps to five hits in six innings, with one strikeout, but was hit hard in the seventh inning when Cleveland scored two runs to tie the game. That was the curtain for the Orioles' importation, and he looked weak in comparison with Dutch Leonard who pitched the last two innings, putting six men out in order, four of them on strikes. Duffy Lewis, who came into the game to pinch hit for Ruth, would be the game-winning run for Boston. With the benefit of hindsight, sending in a pinch hitter to bat for the Babe seems crazy, but he was a pitching prospect, not yet a legendary slugger. Wednesday is July 12th. A letter from a patriot on July 12, 1775, describes the battle that raged on Long Island in Boston Harbor. While we were on Powderhorn Hill, back of Chelsea, we saw a skirmish between a party of our people, 110 in number, who went in whaleboats to an island about 12 miles from Boston and burnt a large quantity of hay, which was put up into bundles by the regulars and intended to be sent to Boston for their horses. A great number of marines and schooners, men-of-war boats, and two ships of war kept up a constant fire on our men while they remained on the island, but this did not prevent them from destroying the hay. The schooners and boats endeavored to cut off their retreat, which brought on a very warm engagement, in which we had one killed and one wounded. The loss of the regulars is not known, but supposed to be considerable, as they were drove off several times and finally obliged to retire, which would not have been the case if they had not lost some men. This was just one of a series of battles and skirmishes on the Boston Harbor Islands, as the British regulars raided them in search of livestock and forage for their horses. Along with Long Island, Little Brewster, Noddles Island, Hog, and Grape Islands would all see skirmishes during the spring and summer of 1775. Abigail Adams wrote to John on July 13, 1776, to tell him that she and the entire family had gotten inoculated against the smallpox without any prior warning to him. I now write from Boston where I yesterday arrived and was with all four of our little ones inoculated for the smallpox. 
Our little ones stood the operation manfully. God grant that we may all go comfortably through the distemper. The physic part is bad enough, I know. I knew your mind so perfectly upon the subject that I thought nothing, but our recovery would give you equal pleasure, and as to safety there was none. The soldiers inoculated privately, and so did many of the inhabitants, and the paper currency spread it everywhere. I immediately determined to set myself about it and get ready with my children. I wish it was so you could have been with us, but I submit. As you'll recall from our inoculation episode, the process back then was no cakewalk, as it basically involved deliberately infecting yourself with a mild case of the pox. A few weeks later, Abigail provided an update on August 5th. I took the precaution of having all mine who had not the symptoms the ninth day inoculated a second time, and I hope they have all passed through except Charlie, and what to do with him I know not. Tommy is cleverly, has about a dozen, and is very gay and happy. I have abundant reason to be thankful that we are so many of us carried comfortably through a disease so formidable in its natural operation. They weren't out of the woods yet by August 14th. Nabby has enough of the smallpox for all the family besides. She is pretty well covered. Not a spot, but what is so sore that she can neither walk, sit, stand, or lay with any comfort. She is as patient as one can expect, but they are a very sore sort. If it was a disorder to which we could be subject more than once, I would go as far as it was possible to avoid it. Charlie remains in the same state he did. Finally, the family headed home to Braintree on August 31st, seven weeks after being inoculated. On Monday, I returned to my own habitation with our little Charles, who is weak and feeble, and who wants the air and exercise of the country to restore him. The little flock have all left me but him. Mrs. Cranch came into town yesterday and carried out Nabby and Tommy. The doctor would not consent to Charles going until Monday. His are but just cleverly turned. But even through all that, the process worked. So vaccinate your kids, people. Friday is July 14th. In episode 24, we talked about the 11th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment. They were the first unit to answer Lincoln's call to arms after the Southern attack on Fort Sumter in April 1861, and they began enlisting on the very first day of the war. Because they were the first to enlist, they called themselves the Minutemen of 61. More than four years later, the tired veterans of the 11th returned back to Massachusetts at Camp Miggs in today's Reedville neighborhood in Hyde Park. They were mustered out on July 14, 1865. Our return was uneventful, circling the works, then double-quicking through the streets of Richmond so hastily that we knew little or nothing of its edifices or peculiarities, thence by easy stages to Washington. Here we remained until orders were received for its discharge at Reedville, Massachusetts, to which place it was transported on the 13th of July and discharged dating July 14th. The regiment was complimented in general orders for gallantry on a number of occasions during the year and was relied on when a difficult and dangerous position was to be wrested from the enemy. The 11th had been in more battles than any other Massachusetts unit but one having fought at 1st and 2nd Bull Run, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, the Wilderness, Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor, Petersburg, and many more, and having been present at the Confederate surrender at Appomattox. Thus, they served literally from the first day of the war to the last. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the philosopher and lapsed Unitarian minister, was invited to speak at Harvard Divinity School's commencement on July 15, 1838. In his address, he would question the divinity of Christ and the necessity of established churches. Jesus Christ belonged to the true race of prophets. He saw with open eye the mystery of the soul. Drawn by its severe harmony, ravished with its beauty, he lived in it and had his being there. Alone in all history, he estimated the greatness of man. One man was true to what is in you and me. He saw that God incarnates himself in man and evermore goes forth anew to take possession of his world. He said in this jubilee of sublime emotion, I am divine. Through me, God acts. Through me, speaks. Would you see God, see me, or see thee, when thou also thinkest as I now think? But what a distortion did his doctrine and memory suffer in the same, in the next, and in the following ages? There is no doctrine of the reason which will bear to be taught by the understanding. The understanding caught this high chant from the poet's lips and said, in the next age, 
this was Jehovah come down out of heaven. I will kill you if you say he was a man. The idioms of his language and the figures of his rhetoric have usurped the place of his truth. And churches are not built on his principles, but on his tropes. Christianity became a mythos, as the poetic teaching of Greece and Egypt before. He spoke of miracles, for he felt that man's life was a miracle, and all that man doth. And he knew that this daily miracle shines as the character ascends. But the word miracle, as pronounced by Christian churches, gives a false impression. It is a monster. It is not one with the blowing clover and the falling rain. Unitarian ministers around New England would write rebuttals, but Emerson's transcendentalism enjoyed increasing influence in the church and in the region through most of the 19th century. Finally, Sunday is July 16th, and on July 16th, 1812, the USS Constitution began the chase and battle that would become one of its most famous engagements. As one of her seamen would later note, you have no doubt heard of the frigate's chase off New York by the English squadron, and the truly able manner with which she was maneuvered for 70 hours. She had just been refitted and was cruising off the coast of New Jersey under the command of Captain Isaac Hull. When a lookout spotted sails, Hull at first thought they might belong to a friendly American vessel. However, he quickly realized that he was looking at a strong British squadron of five ships, one of which had been captured from the Americans just the day before. Sometimes discretion is the better part of valor, and Captain Hull realized that he was going to have to make a break for it. Hull ordered the crew of the Constitution to make ready to sail, and they hoisted every piece of canvas on board. The Constitution quickly put some distance between itself and the pursuing British, but in the wee hours of the next morning, the wind died. A slow speed chase ensued that would make O.J. Simpson's white bronco look like child's play. With both the Constitution and the pursuing British ships becalmed just out of cannon shot from one another, Captain Hull came up with a plan. He ordered the men to lower the boats, and they began rowing, towing the Constitution behind them on heavy cables. The ship began to move and to pull away from the British vessels excruciatingly slowly. Before long, the British realized what was happening and began to row and tow their ships as well. The exhausting chase stretched out through the afternoon, when the breeze finally picked up again. The Constitution, with fresh sails and a clean hull, was able to break away from its pursuers slightly before the calm fell again. And slowly, the British rowed and towed their ships closer to the Constitution. At this point, they were in shallow coastal waters, and one of Hull's officers suggested a technique known as kedging. Kedging is when the crew of a ship puts their anchor on a long line, rows it out ahead of the ship, then drops it and uses the line to draw the ship forward. I'll let military historian John Gutman explain how Captain Hull used it to his advantage. All non-essential ropes were spliced into a line nearly a mile long. One end was tied to a small, sharp-fluked kedging anchor, which was then rowed ahead in the ship's cutter. When the anchor was dropped, the Constitution's crew grabbed the hawser and walked aft, slowly and gingerly at first, then gradually increasing the pace as the ship began to move. Each crewman who reached the stern let go of the line and raced forward to pull anew. Meanwhile, more rope was spliced and another anchor attached, so that while the Constitution was being kedged along on one anchor, the second could be hauled ahead. Hull lost some distance on the British while improvising his kedging arrangements, but once the laborious process got underway, he found the Constitution beginning to leave the British behind again. The British would soon begin kedging as well. Then a breeze sprang up, and they all took to sail, and it died again. As the chase stretched into its third day, both sides were rowing, towing, and kedging again. Finally, a summer squall blew in. Hull made a show of battening down the hatches against the storm, but when the rain had obscured the Constitution from sight, he hoisted sails and jubilantly cruised away from the British pursuers. When the Constitution failed to make a scheduled arrival in New York Harbor, Americans began to worry that she had been lost. But when she sailed unexpectedly into Boston Harbor a few days later, celebration reigned. On her very next cruise, the Constitution would defeat HMS Guerrero, one of the British ships that had pursued her during the three-day chase, in one of the most celebrated sea battles of the era. It's only appropriate to start out the show with a story about the USS Constitution. We're going to be talking about pirates this week, and the Constitution was originally built to fight the Algerian pirates at the end of the 18th century. From the beginning of piracy's golden age to the beginning of the 18th century, 
Piracy on the New England coast was the exception rather than the rule. It was much more common for pirate crews to ply the rich Caribbean or the pirate round, which took them from the New England coast to the shores of India and back. That calm came to an end with the close of the War of the Spanish Succession, which had spilled over into North America as Queen Anne's War. When a peace treaty was signed in 1715, a huge glut of British sailors and privateers who had been fighting the Spanish and French suddenly found themselves at loose ends. Many turned to piracy along the Atlantic coast of North America. One of the most notorious pirates of the era was Black Sam Bellamy. Little is known of Bellamy's early life. He was born in Devonshire, England around 1689 and went to sea at the age of 13, perhaps being pressed into service against his will. He served in the Royal Navy during the War of the Spanish Succession and later tried seeking his fortune on Cape Cod. In 1715, he joined a group of treasure hunters who went looking for Spanish gold along the coast of Florida. Not finding any, Sam Bellamy fell in with a pirate crew led by Benjamin Hornigold and his trusted mate and apprentice, Edward Teach. As his pirate wealth grew, he developed a taste for the finest clothes and dueling pistols, but he never wore the powdered wigs that were fashionable at the time. Instead, he grew his black hair long and tied it back with a black satin bow, which garnered him the nickname Black Sam. After about a year under Hornigold, Black Sam and the crew were frustrated that they were forbidden from attacking ships sailing under the British flag. The crew took a vote, and Hornigold left the ship with his loyal followers, including Edward Teach, who would soon come to be known by his nickname, Blackbeard. The fact that the crew voted on whether to continue under their captain begins to hint at how radically different life was on a pirate vessel at that time from life on a merchant or military vessel. As Peter Linebaugh and Marcus Redeker put it in 2000, long before Lin-Manuel put it to music, the early 18th century pirate ship was a world turned upside down. made so by the Articles of Agreement that established the rules and customs of the pirates' social order, hierarchy from below. Pirates distributed justice, elected officers, divided loot equally, and established a different discipline. They limited the authority of the captain, resisted many of the practices of the capitalist merchant shipping industry, and maintained a multicultural, multiracial, multinational social order. They sought to prove that ships did not have to be run in the brutal and oppressive ways of the merchant service and the Royal Navy. The pirate ship was democratic in an undemocratic age. The pirates allowed their captain unquestioned authority in chase and battle, but otherwise insisted that he be governed by a majority. As one observer noted, they permit him to be captain on condition that they may be captain over him. Sam Bellamy and the rest of the pirates we'll meet in this episode lived by this code. They were bound to each other by a ship's articles, the contract they would enter into together and they were radically democratic in an age of strict hierarchies. Another author explained the temptation of this life as the radical, doomed sphere of resistance pirates offered to the enormous cruelty of the developing Atlantic economy, grinding exploitation of white sailors in the service of the black slave trade under the iron hand of the British Empire. Bellamy's crew put their faith and their votes in him, and for a while he steered them true. In the spring of 1717, Bellamy was sailing aboard the Marianne in the Windward Passage between Hispaniola and Cuba when he saw what would become one of the most famous pirate ships in history. The Ouida was a newly built slave ship on its mated voyage in the Triangle Trade. Having delivered a cargo of at least 312 enslaved Africans to the plantations in the West Indies, it was now loaded with gold, silver, indigo, ivory, sugar, spices, and other trade goods bound back to Africa. She was a large, fast, heavily armed ship, and Bellamy wanted her from the moment he first saw her. After a three-day chase, the captain of the Ouida surrendered the moment the first shot was fired. Sam Bellamy gave the vanquished captain of the Ouida a sloop in return for the grand vessel, and a quantity of gold to compensate him for his trouble. For acts like this, the crew sometimes referred to Black Sam by another nickname, Robin Hood of the Sea. In seeking a ship captured from another captain, Bellamy let his true feelings about the rich be known. Damn them for a pack of crafty rascals, 
and you who serve them, for a parcel of hen-hearted numbskulls. They vilify us, the scoundrels do, when there is only this difference. They rob the poor under the cover of law, and we plunder the rich under the protection of our own courage. Now, Sam Bellamy found himself at the helm of one of the finest pirate ships to ply the seas. He had a rich treasure, 28 guns, and a 150-man crew. His original ship, the Marianne, was captained by a trusted lieutenant, and together they rampaged up the east coast of North America. In just over two months, they captured 53 ships, amassing the most valuable pirate booty in English history. As they entered New England waters, the crew of the Marianne voted to steer towards Rhode Island, where some of the members had family. Black Sam and the Weta continued north around Cape Cod. Unfortunately, they ran straight into a powerful nor'easter. On April 26, 1717, gale force winds drove the Weta into a sandbar near Wellfleet. The main mast blew away in the storm, and the powerful surf soon capsized the ship. Four and a half tons of gold went down to the sandy bottom, along with 144 members of the crew. There were at least 60 cannons on board, and as the storm tossed them around the ship, they quickly smashed it to splinters. In the morning, the people of Wellfleet discovered and buried 102 bodies on their beach. They found huge quantities of timbers and other wreckage, but the vast treasure was never recovered. They did find two survivors from the crew, a Welshman named Thomas Davis and a man named John Julian. Julian is sometimes reported to be a Native American from one of the Cape Cod tribes and sometimes a member of the Mosquito tribes of Central America. The two survivors from the Ouida were imprisoned in Boston along with seven members of the Mary Ann's crew who'd been captured in Rhode Island. A court found that Bellamy had forced two of the men into piracy and they were freed. In October of 1717, six of them were tried in an admiralty court in Boston and sentenced to death. To give you an idea of the international flavor aboard a pirate ship, the six who were executed were a Jamaican, two Dutchmen, a Swede, a Frenchman, and a Dutch New Yorker. They were hanged at Charlestown on November 15, 1717. That leaves one survivor. As a Native American, John Julian had few rights under English law. As a result, he didn't stand trial. Instead, the province sold him into slavery. He was purchased by John Quincy, the grandfather of Abigail Smith Adams, and namesake of both John Quincy Adams and the town of Quincy. If you thought that a former bloodthirsty pirate would become a docile slave, you'd be wrong. Quincy reported that he was unruly and sold him to another master. Julian made several attempts to escape, and in one of these he killed a bounty hunter. For the murder of the bounty hunter, John Julian was hanged on March 22, 1733. A week later, the Boston Newsletter reported that his body had been given to medical students for dissection, and that his skeleton would be preserved as a specimen. Thus was the fate of the last survivor of Black Sam Bellamy's pirate crew. Now that we've heard how one president's great-grandfather enslaved a pirate, Let's hear how another president's great-grandfather killed one. John Phillips started his seagoing career as a ship's carpenter until his ship was captured by pirates in 1721. When the pirates learned that he was a skilled carpenter, he was forced into a life of piracy on pain of death, but he soon found that he liked that life. By 1723, Phillips had stolen a schooner and set out with a crew of his own in search of adventure. One of the things that makes Captain Phillips memorable is that we have copies of his articles, the written agreement that his crew agreed to be bound by. It is one of only four sets of articles that survives from the golden age of piracy. Number one, every man shall obey civil command. The captain shall have one full share and a half of all prizes. The master, carpenter, bosun, and gunner shall have one share and a quarter. Number two, if any man shall offer to run away or keep any secret from the company, he shall be marooned with one bottle of powder, one bottle of water, one small arm, and a shot. Number three. If any man shall steal anything in the company or game to the value of a piece of eight, he shall be marooned or shot. Number four. If at any time we shall meet another mariner, that man who shall sign his articles without the consent of our company shall suffer such punishment as the captain and company shall think fit. 
Number five, that man that shall strike another whilst these articles are in force shall receive Moses' law, that is, 40 stripes lacking one on the bare back. Number six, that man that shall snap his arms or smoke tobacco in the hold without a cap to his pipe or carry a candle lighted without a lantern shall suffer the same punishment as in the former article. Number seven, that man who shall not keep his arms clean, fit for an engagement, or neglect his business, shall be cut off from his share, and suffer such other punishment as the captain and the company shall think fit. Number eight, if any man shall lose a joint in time of an engagement, he shall have 400 pieces of eight. If a limb, 800. And lastly, number nine, if at any time you meet with a prudent woman, that man that offers to meddle with her without her consent shall suffer present death. The articles are concerned with fairness, safety, and readiness to fight, but perhaps most surprising is the prohibition against rape. On an earlier voyage, Captain Phillips had witnessed a gang rape and murder that had shocked him to the core, and he would not tolerate a similar crime from his crew. With an agreement in place, Phillips and his crew wandered around the Caribbean, taking what prizes they could find, before heading to the waters off Newfoundland to prey on fishermen. They slowly built the crew with volunteers from the ships they captured, and sometimes with less willing sailors, who were forced into piracy at gunpoint and whipped mercilessly. One such unwilling recruit was John Fillmore of Ipswich. He was captured on a fishing vessel on September 5, 1723. Fillmore was unhappy as a pirate. He asked several times to be set free, even if it meant marooning him on a deserted island. And he even attempted to escape one time, and narrowly avoided being executed by an enraged Captain Phillips. But Fillmore would have the last laugh. The town records of Boston for 1724 record that on the 3rd of May the town was thrown into much surprise by the arrival of an unknown vessel in the harbor, and it was soon found that it had been captured from pirates. A few young men who, having been forced into the service of the dreaded sea rover Captain John Phillips, seizing an opportunity, killed him and his principal men somewhere about the banks of Newfoundland, and sailing hence, succeeded in reaching Boston in safety with their prize, and six of the pirates as prisoners. The crucial moment had come a few weeks earlier, when Phillips drafted some more sailors into his crew against their will. Together with John Fillmore, they planned to win back their freedom. Fillmore and his co-conspirators found an excuse to have some carpentry work half done on the deck, with several tools lying around close at hand. On April 18th, while the leaders of the pirate crew were drinking heavily, the rebels put their plan into effect. Fillmore's own memoir says, The captain and bosun stood by the mainmast, talking upon some matters, and I stood partly behind them, whirling the axe around with my foot, till my knees fairly smote together. The master being busied, I saw a cheeseman make the motion to heave him over, and I at that instant split the bosun's head in twain with the broad axe, and dropped him upon the deck to welter in his gore. Before the captain had time to put himself in a posture of defense, I gave him a stroke with the head of my axe, which partly stunned him, at which time Cheeseman, having dispatched the master overboard, came to my assistance, and gave the captain a blow with his hammer on the back side of his head, which put an immediate end to his mortal existence. The quartermaster, hearing the bustle, came running out of the cabin with his hand up to strike Cheeseman with his hammer, and probably would have killed him had not the Indian catched him by his elbow as he was bringing the hammer down, and there held him, until I came up and gave him a blow on the back side of his head, cutting his wig and neck almost off, so that his head hung down before him. After Fillmore split the heads of Phillips and another pirate with his axe, he decapitated Phillips and put his head into a pickling jar. With this evidence that they'd been held against their will, the mutineers sailed for Boston and freedom, with the remainder of the pirate crew as their prisoners. The surviving pirates were hanged in Boston on June 2, 1724. John Fillmore would live until 1777, starting a family. Many years later, his great-grandson, Millard Fillmore, would be elected President of the United States. If the cruel shipmaster John Phillips had a reputation for leniency because of the prohibition against rape on his ship, Captain Ned Lowe is remembered as one of the most brutal pirate captains in history. By all accounts, he absolutely reveled in torturing his victims. Edward Lowe was born in London and grew up running wild in the streets. 
He earned a reputation as a pickpocket and gambler, while his younger brother Richard became a notorious thief. After Richard was hanged in his early teens, Ned decided to seek his fortune in the New World. He headed to New England around 1710, and after a few years settled in Boston. After his wife died in childbirth, Ned abandoned his young daughter and took to the sea. When he felt that the captain of the lumber sloop he was working on had mistreated him, Lowe and a handful of others stole a ship off the coast of Rhode Island, saying that they would go in her, make a black flag, and declare war against all the world. Sailing to the Cayman Islands, the small crew fell in with the pirate captain George Lowther and sailed under him for a few months. Lowe distinguished himself, and after the combined crew captured a brigantine named Rebecca on May 28, 1722, Lowther made Lowe its captain, with a crew of 44. Much like John Phillips, Ned Lowe created a set of articles to govern his ship, and like Phillips, Lowe's articles survive to this day. They're quite similar. Number one, the captain is to have two full shares, the quartermaster is to have one share and a half, the doctor, mate, gunner, and bosun, one share and one quarter. Number two, he that shall be found guilty of taking up any unlawful weapon on board of the privateer or any other prize by us taken, so as to strike or abuse one another in any regard, shall suffer what punishment the captain and the majority of the company shall see fit. Number three, he that shall be found guilty of cowardice in the time of engagement shall suffer what punishment the captain and the majority of the company shall think fit. Number four, if any gold, jewels, silver, etc. be found on board of any prize or prizes to the value of a piece of eight, and the finder do not deliver it to the quartermaster in the space of twenty-four hours, he shall suffer what punishment the captain and the majority of the company shall see fit. Number five, he that is found guilty of gaming or defrauding one another to the value of a royal of plate shall suffer what punishment the captain and the majority of the company shall think fit. Number six, he that shall have the misfortune to lose a limb in the time of engagement shall have the sum of 600 pieces of eight and remain aboard as long as he shall think fit. Number seven, good quarters to be given when craved. Number eight, he that sees a sail first shall have the best pistol or small arm aboard her. Number nine, he that shall be guilty of drunkenness in time of engagement shall suffer what punishment the captain and majority of the company shall think fit. Number 10, no snapping of guns in the hold. Over the next year, Lowe and his crew divided their time between the rich shipping lanes in the Caribbean and the rich fishing grounds of the Grand Banks. They captured over a hundred vessels, trading up from one ship to the next and slowly building a pirate fleet. It was during this period that Ned Lowe earned his reputation for extreme cruelty. Despite his self-imposed rule to offer a prisoner quarter, that is, to accept surrender instead of death, anyone who refused to comply with the captain was fair game. In one early engagement, a news account of the time said that on Lowe's orders the crew cut and whipped some, and others they burnt with matches between their fingers to the bone to make them confess where their money was. He only became more extreme over time. The general history of the pirates says that after taking two whaleboats near Rhode Island, he caused one of the master's bodies to be ripped up and his entrails to be taken out and cut off the ears of the other and made him eat them himself with pepper and salt. Upon hearing that a Portuguese captain had thrown his gold into the sea rather than handing it over, Lowe ordered the captain's lips to be cut off, which he broiled before his face, and afterwards murdered him and all the crew, being 32 persons. It was after the capture and torture near Rhode Island that Ned Lowe came to the attention of the authorities in Boston, who prepared to send a squadron out to pursue him. The New England Courant, a Boston newspaper published by James Franklin, reported on the developments in the June 11, 1722 edition. On Monday morning last, His Honor the Governor had advice by a whaleboat from Block Island that there was at that island a pirate brigantine, whereupon the drums were ordered immediately to beat about town for volunteers to go in quest of the pirates, and by three of the clock the same day there were two large sloops under sail, equipped and manned. 
We are advised from Boston that the government of Massachusetts are fitting out a ship to go after the pirates, to be commanded by Governor Peter Papillion, and tis thought he will sail sometime this month if wind and weather permit. The above pirate brigantine is commanded by one Lowe, who lately belonged to Boston. The brigantine the pirates are now in belonged to Boston, and was bound there from St. Christopher's, when she was taken by a pirate sloop of about 10 guns and 90 men. Seems like an innocent enough reporting of the news, right? Well, the provincial authorities didn't think so. They thought that the paragraph about the provincial government outfitting a ship made it sound as though they didn't take the pirate threat seriously. The Massachusetts House of Representatives passed a resolve against the Courant and James Franklin the next week. The board having had consideration of a paragraph in a paper called the New England Courant, published Monday last, relating to the fitting out of a ship here to proceed against the pirates, and having examined James Franklin Printer, he acknowledged himself to be publisher thereof and finding the paragraph to be grounded on a letter pretended by him to be received from Rhode Island, resolved that the said paragraph is a high affront to this government. Resolved that the sheriff of the county of Suffolk do forthwith commit to the jail in Boston the body of James Franklin Printer for the gross affront offered to this government in his current of Monday last, there to remain during this session. With that, James Franklin was thrown into prison and day-to-day -day management of the newspaper was turned over to his apprentice and younger brother, Ben. In his autobiography, Benjamin Franklin recalled how he got his start in newspaper publishing, the profession that would eventually bring him to national prominence, indirectly through Ned Lowe's piracy. One of the pieces in our newspaper on some political point, which I have now forgotten, gave offense to the assembly. James was taken up, censured, and imprisoned for a month by the Speaker's warrant. I, too, was taken up and examined before the council, but though I did not give them any satisfaction, they contented themselves with admonishing me, and dismissed me, considering me perhaps as an apprentice who was bound to keep his master's secrets. During my brother's confinement, which I resented a good deal, notwithstanding our private differences, I had the management of the paper, and I made bold to give our rulers some rubs in it, which my brother took very kindly, while others began to consider me in an unfavorable light, as a young genius that had a turn for libeling and satire. My brother's discharge was accompanied with an order of the house, a very odd one, that James Franklin should no longer print the paper called the New England Courant. There was a consultation held in our printing house among his friends what he should do in this case. Some proposed to evade the order by changing the name of the paper, but my brother seeing inconveniences in that, it was finally concluded on as a better way to let it be printed for the future under the name of Benjamin Franklin. The cruise against Ned Lowe out of Boston Harbor eventually involved a hundred sailors, and they chased Lowe along the coast of Nova Scotia, but never caught him. Nevertheless, the pirate captain's luck had turned. After a series of unsuccessful engagements with the Royal Navy, Lowe's fleet began to dwindle. In late 1723, his flagship, Merry Christmas, found itself alone. In heading for Brazil, it sailed straight out of the history books. Ned Lowe was never heard from again. Some accounts say that his ship sank in a storm, while others say that he was marooned by his crew or even hanged by the French. The last great pirate of the Golden Age enjoyed a meteoric rise and fall in a piratical career that spanned just one month. An experienced seaman named William Fly enlisted as a bosun on a ship named the Elizabeth in Jamaica in the spring of 1726. But early in the cruise, he and the crew became resentful of their bad usage at the hands of the captain. In the wee hours of the night on May 27th, the crew mutinied, dragging the captain and first mates from their beds and throwing them into the sea to drown. When the captain grabbed onto the mainsail to try and save himself, the ship's cooper took an axe and chopped the offending hand off. The crew renamed the ship Fame's Revenge, elected William Fly captain, and began sailing up the east coast of North America. They stitched together a Jolly Roger and tried to emulate the amazing blitz up the east coast that Black Sam Bellamy had enjoyed. However, where Bellamy had captured 53 ships by the time he made it to New England waters, Fly and Fame's Revenge only managed to take five ships. The first two he had captured off the coast of North Carolina, burning one of them and convincing several sailors to join his crew. For some reason, he took some likely seamen prisoner when they refused to sign his articles and join the crew, 
including William Atkinson, who was forced to act as Fly's pilot. Next, they attacked a ship near Virginia, but it turned out to be full of Scots-Irish immigrants bound for Pennsylvania, rather than the rich treasure that they had hoped for. Moving into New England waters, they looted a whaler off Newfoundland and sailed for the fishing fleet around Brown's Bank, east of Cape Ann. On June 29th, Fly's crew attacked the James, the first fishing vessel they encountered. Then they divided their forces as more fishing boats came into view. The plan was to leave a skeleton crew on Fame's Revenge to attack the fleet head-on, while the rest of the pirates boarded the captured James and attempted to flank the fleet. However, this movement that Captain Fly and his pirates on the Fame's Revenge were now outnumbered by the forced men aboard, those who had been forced into service. While Captain Fly was distracted by the prospect of fresh captures, the unwilling pilot, William Atkinson, led a party of mutineers in stealing cutlasses and a brace of pistols from the pirate armory. Then they rushed Fly and his pirates, holding them at gunpoint and throwing them in irons just 33 days after they had turned pirate in the first place. With Atkinson at the helm, Fame's Revenge made good time in their voyage to Boston. On July 4, 1726, an admiralty court met in Boston to sort out the fate of William Fly and his men. Atkinson and the mutineers were quickly cleared of all charges. A young cook was granted a pardon. Captain Fly and three of his crew were sentenced to hang. On July 12th, thousands of people gathered on Copps Hill in the North End to watch the four pirates meet their fate. When it was William Fly's turn to mount the gallows, he trotted swiftly up the stairs, carrying a nosegay of sweet-smelling flowers, and he smiled and waved at the crowds. Suddenly, Fly's smile turned to a frown as he saw the sloppy noose the novice executioner had tied. He rebuked the man for not understanding his trade. Taking the rope, Fly, with his own hands, rectified matters to render things more convenient and effectual. Having tied the noose with a sailor's confidence in knots, he placed the rope around his own neck. Asked for his last words, Fly chose to use his last breaths to issue a warning. Addressing the port city crowd thick with ship captains and sailors, he proclaimed his final, fondest wish, that all masters of vessels might take warning by the fate of the captain that he had murdered, and to pay sailors their wages when due, and to treat them better, saying that their barbarity to them made so many turn pirates. Pirate historian Marcus Redeker argues that the death of William Fly marked the end of the Golden Age of Piracy. From the end of the War of the Spanish Succession to this point, there had been a shared set of traditions and practices among pirates, passed down in an unbroken chain through a succession of crews. By splintering, by sailing in consorts, or by other associations, roughly 3,600 pirates, about 90% of all those active between 1716 and 1726, fitted into two main lines of genealogical descent. Captain Benjamin Hornigold and the pirate rendezvous in the Bahamas stood at the origin of an intricate lineage that ended with the hanging of John Phillips' crew in June of 1724. The second line spawned in the chance meeting of the lately mutinous crews of George Lothar and Edward Lowe in 1722 culminated in the executions of William Fly and his men in July 1726. It was primarily within and through this network that the social organization of the pirate ship took on its significance, transmitting and preserving customs and meanings, and helping to structure and perpetuate the pirate's social world. William Fly's death may have meant the end of the Golden Age, but it didn't yet mean the end of Captain Fly. The next edition of the Boston Newsletter reports that their bodies were carried in a boat to a small island called Nix's Mate, about two leagues from the town, where the above said fly was hung up in irons as a spectacle for the warning of others, especially seafaring men. The other two were buried there. Thus, Fly was gibbeted, suffering the same fate on Boston Harbor that Captain Kidd suffered in London. After his death, Fly's body was wrapped in chains and displayed as a warning to any future sailors who might consider turning pirate. Nix's mate was a tiny island that lay right on the main shipping channel in Boston Harbor, so any seaman heading into or out of the Port of Boston would have a chance to heed this warning. Today, Nix's mate is one of Boston's lost harbor islands. At high tide, all that's visible is a black and white banded pyramid of granite, and at low tide, just a gravel bar. Nonetheless, the longtime historian of Boston Harbor, Edward Rose Snow, would later claim to have discovered Fly's gibbet. 
200 years later, I went ashore on the bar which surrounds the granite wall and pyramid now known as Nix's Mate, and carefully explored the shifting sands, rocks, and silt, which comprises part of what is left of the pirate island. After several days of searching and digging, I located what probably was the spot where Fly was gibbeted, for a fragment of the iron band and several links of chain were uncovered. This was all that could be found which recalled in any way the nefarious and villainous Captain William Fly. To learn more about pirates on Boston Harbor, check out this week's show notes at hubhistory.com slash 036. We'll have photos showing what Nix's mate looks like today, as well as a link to a National Geographic article describing how divers found the wreck of Black Sam's ship, the Weta, off Cape Cod. And we'll have a link to the museum where you can see artifacts recovered from the wreck, the only shipwreck to be recovered from piracy's golden age, and the richest pirate treasure ever found. And of course, we'll have links and sources for all of this week's historical anniversaries, including a YouTube video demonstrating how kedging works. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at podcast at hubhistory.com. We're at Hub History on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Or you can go to hubhistory.com and click on the Contact Us link. And while you're on the site, hit the subscribe link and be sure that you never miss an episode. If you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, please write us a brief review. It's the best way to help others discover the show. That's all for now. We'll be back next week with an episode about organized crime in Boston, per the request of one of our listeners.